For Each and for All by Eric Walker Wickstrom. We light this chalice for all who are here and all who are not. For all who have ever walked through our doors. For those who may yet find this spirited, spiritual ha home and for those we can't even yet imagine. For each of us and for us all, may this flame burn warm and bright. People have to dream a church into being. They must have a vision for what it could be and allow themselves to believe in that vision. We come today grateful for all of those dreamers, for people have to labor for a church to become into being. They have to meet, and they have to plan, they have to find agreement, they have to make calls and write letters, teach religious education, lead committees, work on the grounds, and raise the money for their dream. We come today grateful for those laborers, for people must love a church into being. When they get weary, when things seem scarce, when they can't agree, they must love hard enough to see it through, to see in one another the hope and the salvation of the world. We come today grateful for all who have loved this church into what and who we are today. And now we are those people. It's our blessing, it's our honor, and it's our turn. Come, let us worship together. Now please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, The Fire of Commitment which is number 1028 in your teal hymnal.
Please join me now in a spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life, spirit of love, help us to remember how much we have to offer one another. How dearly our generosity matters in this place, in this spiritual home of ours. May we have the courage to share our light, to give of ourselves authentically, fully, and to receive the blessing of this community with an abundance of gratitude. For what a joy it is to belong, to have something to offer, and to celebrate the gifts of everyone around us. Let us hold all of this in our hearts as we enter into a time of silent meditation. Well, now I would invite forward our annual fund drive co-chairs, uh, Mary Corthell and Don Rolfe. Uh, so my name's Don Rolfe. I'm the co-chair of the annual fund drive this year, and... I'm Mary Corthell, and I'm the co-chair with Don. Our theme this year is the healing power of a generous community. Um, we're going to talk about the three legs, which I always find important in any in a community such as ours. They're the people who are in it. They're the things we do. And then there's the financial support that goes with that. I would build did a wonderful discussion of what we have done last night. I'm trying to match his eloquence. Um, this community has been through a, a lot, as have all of us. The COVID years were hard on the community. They were hard on the individuals. We're now starting to recover from that. We can see that because, as Bill said last night, we've moved from being, can we make this work, to 
we're making it work, not a lot of margin, but we're making it work, and now we're doing other things, and I'd like to explore the other things we're doing. So one of the things we're doing is we are taking collections, and we're not doing it just dedicated to us. We're doing it to other organizations in the community that also need our help. We are looking at our church, and we have gone from struggling just to break even and keep up with the minimum maintenance to you'll see there's an electric charger outside with the leadership of Jeanette we have inserts in the windows downstairs which save us by the way $400 at least a year in heat and then Jeanette with a strong support of the board has a process in place for us to go look at the windows on the sanctuary here and do some major repairs here we have a social justice incubator, which is spawning a whole set of activities, including a social justice book club, and I could continue on and on with what we've done. But basically, we have moved from we're struggling just to survive to we're now beginning to see beyond that and do the things we also wanted to do. And I think that will set us up for Mary to describe who we are. So, um... In thinking about today and our message, it caused me to reflect on the chalice of light we each carry in our heart and how that light goes out into the world and how do we tend that light? What brings us to the place to thrive from within, to be able to give back to the world in a way that in our small, tiny way makes a difference? And when I think of one of the ways that gives me the sustenance to move forward, to weave into my tapestry while I'm on this earth, it's First Parish. And in the ways in which money is a form of energy, and that energy is how we tend our lives, we can also give through commitment in time, in expertise. But in the movement of this time of year, which is spring, where life is starting to move under the earth, it is incumbent upon all of us in our reflections of the annual fund drive is to think about our chalice and the chalice within of walking from a place of heart and heartfulness and how do we tend our garden of First Parish. And as Bill spoke so eloquently last night, which I will not try to sum up, it's about moving from scarcity to abundance. And we can't do that without financial stewardship. So we ask everyone at this time to sit with their families, to think about their heart, to think about the light they're bringing into the world, and what takes care of your heart. And I hope, and I think I'm right, that for all of us, First Parish is a piece of that soil that keeps us strong, that can be like the willow that bends in a storm, such as COVID. And also, we are the stewards of now. This is our place, a baton we are carrying, that we will in turn hand to many children like Bo and his friend, um, and Zenith, who is here, and I see Noble way up there because we're holding that baton and it's incumbent upon us. We are the stewards. So with Dawn as my co-partner, um, we are just delighted to kick this off. And we have tremendous enthusiasm. We're sprinkling that throughout and on Zoom. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Dawn. All right, so now we'll go hit uh, the rubber, hit the road here. We have as a target this year, raising about $140,000. That, when we combine it with the board's ability and Eve Potts' ability to find uh, a tenant for downstairs, that looks like we'll probably have close to enough money to be for the board and this community to do what it needs to do. We have already reached out to some of the members of this community. We'll talk about that in a minute, but first, we're gonna be reaching out to the rest of you. So we have a set of leaders, Allison, David Temple, and Cunningham, 
who have agreed to work with the committee itself, of which we've got Duncan, George, Fritz, myself, oh, and I forgot Arnold Kombach, who's going to be assisting us as well, who will be reaching out to every pledge unit that is pledged or all new members who have signed the book. Uh, if you haven't been reached out to, then please let us know. If you would like us to reach out to you and you're not one of those communities, let Mary or I know. So what does this mean? This means, first of all, we've raised already over 50% of the goal, and we have already one-third, approximately, of the pledges in. We're going to be reaching out to all of you, but the success rate is such we're doing, it looks like, better than a 5% increase in pledges this year due to the enthusiasm and the generosity of all of you. And so we look forward to getting in touch with you. Please think in your hearts what this community means to you. And when you, your pledge lead reads, uh, reaches out to you, please respond generously. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to the two of you for all of your leadership in this area. We all appreciate that so much. Well, now I would like to inv invite forward Bill Wyans to share with us a poem that he wrote many years ago about this beloved congregation. Actually, I want to start by thanking Mary and Don for their generous words. Uh, and although it may seem churlish to offer a rebuttal, I do have to point out I may have given the wrong impression to some of you last night. The board is looking into ways to afford an engineering study that we very much need, and we are talking about the possibility of some sort of a membership outreach coordinator. Those discussions are very tentative, and we're not sure where they're going to go. So just so you all know, if the board proceeds with those ideas, they will be offered as recommendations to the congregation to be voted on as part of our annual budget at the annual meeting. These are not foregone conclusions, and I'm sorry if I misled anyone. That being said, uh, 15 years ago, Rob Huntington and Susan McCafferty left this church after a very active decade or more of membership when Rob took a position as president of Huntington University, or, sorry, of Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio, a position he still holds. And at the time I wrote this poem as a kind of a farewell for them. Here, a sacred ground. And so they came three and a half centuries ago, traveling from Boston in stages, 10 or 15 miles a day. And so it came to pass, they settled on this ground. No doubt some one of the congregation said, the rise across the field sits as well, its prospects as pleasing, its lay as dry. But here, another said, is the best place. And so it became. Between the path and brook, this small flat became sacred. A sanctuary was raised, in time rebuilt, raised and turned, topped, toppled, retopped. The originary insight reconfirmed, resanctified. This place, for now, my place, neither here nor there, but here. Here where I bring my joy, my children, my private sorrow, myself where I seek to raise above uncomprehending earth a holy place, a sanctuary, a striving, a sense. I am here where others were before, those who made here a sacred ground. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Some of you may know the story about why we hang that old horseshoe on the door of the sanctuary. Some newer members may not. 
Uh, it's a story that's been told many times, a story that speaks to a, a very challenging time in the uh, history of this congregation. Now, thanks to the recollections of several of our long-term members, uh, the Horseshoe story has finally been written down. So I would like to invite forward Bo Raza to share that story with us. Nearly 50 years ago, sometime during the 1970s, FPUU Medfield faced a very dark moment. Membership had dropped very low, so low that they had to consider closing the church. They simply did not have enough members to keep the church going. One day, the remaining members had a meeting inside the church and decided to close First Parish. After a meeting, two members named Joe Needle and Roy McQuillan we were, ta were walking around the church grounds. The parking area was a dirt lot that time, and many, many years earlier, there was a horse shelter in the lot for folks who came to church in their horse-drawn carriages. Joe Needle kicked the ground, and underneath a half-buried horseshoe, he and Roy took it as a lucky omen and resolved to keep the church open. We assume that it that the horseshoe was a remnant of the horse and carriage era. Perhaps it was taking us to the past, reminding of our first parish legacy. The horseshoe still, still hangs inside our church today. If you've never noticed it, take a look on your way out. Thank you, Bo. All right, well, now I'd invite forward uh, Noble Castle to share with us a poem. We Carry the Flame by Douglas Taylor. Across the generations, we have carried the flame. We fought the injustice, sang the songs, spoke for truth, and built something lasting. We join in line and we carry the flame forward. Across the generations, we are tending the flame. Hand in hand, together we share in the wor work of fighting injustice, singing the songs, speaking the truth. And we are here to build something lasting. We join the line and carry the flame forward. Across the generations, we have been nourished by this flame. We are, s we sing, we are singing new songs, breaking old barriers, sharing the work, and as we find our own space in what has been, we are here to make space for the next person as well. We join in the line and we carry the flame forward. Across the generations, this flame comes to us. We are here for the songs, for the justice, for the community sharing the work. We are here now to build, to build something new and lasting. We are ready for a new day to, together. We join the line and carry the flame forward. Great job, thank you. All right, well now I'd ask Mary Corthell to come forward and introduce the offering. Good morning. So this morning we are collecting our offering and splitting it with the various food pantries in the local area. And so as we all reach into our wallet to put into the box, I'm not sure if it has an actual name, to just think about those who have less than we do and are wondering how they're going to put food on the table. And knowing that these shelters are nearby what that means to them in feeding their families. So thank you for your generosity.
When I was in seminary learning about pastoral care, my professor lifted up the importance of always remembering joy as an integral part to the work that we're doing. As we learn to offer spiritual support to anyone experiencing sickness, loneliness, grief, she never let us forget that we must always remember the joy. See, joy was not a distraction from their challenges, but an essential component in the full experience of life and faith. She reminded us that joy was still a part of the suffering person's life. This professor, Britta Gill Austern, she writes, creating space for joy is not a secondary matter or a frill, but a central pastoral practice, right at the heart of faithful and committed ministries. It's possible to establish more life-giving thoughts and make them habitual so that we don't carry around extra burdens we don't need. See, she considers joy to be life-giving and affirming. She found that the capacity for joy can be nurtured and enlarged, and she charged us to help in that role. Now, this is the, the key part of what we do together here at First Parish. We work to stretch our capacity for joy. We remind one another of our humanity, and we never know what might ripple out when we do that. There's a quote I picked up years ago when I visited the Kennedy Space Center. It was in a display about one of the astronauts, and it's always stuck with me. It said, may my light burn brightly in my sphere of influence. Maybe the light burning is some art that you create that was sold years ago that now lives in the house of a stranger. Maybe it was a, a letter you wrote to a loved one that they treasure. Maybe it was that time that you modeled kindness to a student, to a friend. Maybe it was that time when you calmed a nervous patient. Burn brightly. It's a reminder to use our gifts well and develop our vocations and use our skills in the world. Burn brightly. It also offers an image of bringing a lightness into the world, of spreading joy. Merriment, a type of joy at times, but also a deeper sense of joy that helps us not to lose sight of the big picture. A joy that is life-affirming. A joy that helps us to bring more connection. But I wonder if we might want to adapt the quote a bit to center the work here at First Parish. Perhaps, may our light burn brightly in our sphere of influence should become, may we spread joy in our sphere of influence. For as a congregation, we are a launch pad for spreading light. We're a center of connection. We feel joy as well as challenges. But we are not just those present here this morning, or even those of us on our list of members and friends. We is wider. We reminds us our sphere of influence stretches well beyond our doors. FPUU serves the purpose of a connection center in our various communities. Importantly, we do this work as an institution. Institution is a name we give to the structure that helps us to keep human connection in the forefront. Our universities and schools are institutions, our, our libraries, our hospitals, our museums, our nonprofits in so many forms, all types of institutions. And there's something special about an institution, a structured group which has a mission and finds the needed resources to live out the group's mission. We keep these doors open, not just for those here at this moment, but for those who might come in years to come, who need an open door and a place to land in the weeks and years to come. FPUU rests upon those who have come before 
and created this launch pad where we nurture and expand our capacity for joy, our capacity for fully living life. As we've heard, today is the kickoff of our annual fund drive. Today we talk frankly about the financial resources needed to sustain the basics so that we can be a vibrant congregation bringing our light and joy out into the world. It's a reminder day that all institutions, including First Parish, need care to go forward in this role. So I ask, how would you like to invest in the work of this caring community? How would you like to invest in a community with open doors that serves as a launch pad for living out your values? To be sure, we are a launch pad with, with bills to pay, where we appreciate heat in the building, and we have a staff that we must take care of. Maybe your decision on pledging this year starts with honoring your sense of gratitude. And maybe you've already pledged, and for that, we thank you. On the subject of gratitude, Tara Brock, a meditation teacher in the Washington, D.C. area, notes, gratitude is like breathing in, letting ourselves be touched by the goodness in others and in our worlds. Take a moment and sense your gratitude for this place in this community, the connections built week to week, year to year. There are personal connections to be sure, yet the connections are to be something beyond the personal, to something greater than ourselves. If gratitude is what we breathe in, Brock shares, generosity is like breathing out, sensing our mutual belonging and offering our care. When we are awake and whole, breathing in and out happens naturally. So how generous would you like to be this year to sustain this congregation? It will, of course, vary for each of us. Our financial capabilities vary, of course. That's a very practical reality. We all need to make what we can, to share what we can, and choose what we can share. But there's a, a leap of faith in financial generosity. The breathing out it means parting with money. And maybe the thought is, if I give or spend money for one thing, I'll have to sacrifice using it for something else, something I don't want to do, and I don't like that feeling. Even if I don't, ha if I don't know what the other thing is yet, well, I like the security of holding tight to what I have. Maybe that fits for you when you think of sharing what you can with First Parish. Perhaps you think of pledging not as a spreading joy time or as a reluctant parting with your financial resources. Let's consider another perspective on generosity. How do you feel when you give a gift to a family member? Have you ever boldly given a bigger gift than someone expected? Have you ever picked up a tab at a meal? given a special gift to a grandchild? And how did that giving feel? Joyful? Satisfying? In those moments, you gave a part of yourself to another, and you could feel the connection. You were spreading joy by letting your light shine through a gift. What if you see your stewardship pledge as that type of gift to this community? a way that you help bring the joy of connection into the world, to invest in a place you care about. The reality is it does cost a bit more year to year to sustain First Parish. And for those who are able, an increase in your pledge would be lovely, a joyful increase. What might you joyfully pledge this year? For those who are new, what would help your sense of engagement here? And for everyone, how might we invest through our pledges to feel that we are breathing out generosity? To live joyfully, to live generously. It's a way of living boldly. In part, it's about timing. It's about living now. 
It's about not living a life in a waiting pattern or in a guarded stance. Living joyfully is often about the courage to live connected lives, to step into the risks of relationship and a promise to show up for one another and to do so with a generous spirit. It takes courage to join and then to stay in a community. We give up some certainty and control when we commit with our hearts and our heads and our hands. We do so for the chance to belong, to create and participate with others, and to walk through joys and through all of the hard stuff together. When we live with joy, we take risks. We have less predictability in some ways, and in others, so many more. We live boldly to feel whole and vital in a world that needs us to shine every bit of light that we can for ourselves and for one another. So today is your chance to live joyfully as you make your pledge to First Parish to nourish this home. May you each find a path to giving joyfully to sustain and enrich this community of joy and connection. So may it be. Amen. Now please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, We'll Build a Land, number 121 in your gray hymnal.
May we leave this place and share our lights. May we trust that it is in sharing our gifts that we live with joy and not fear. That we trust in building a world centered around love and the ways it will ripple out and in ways that we don't yet know. Go in peace. Go in love. Go knowing love surrounds you wherever you may go. now extinguish our chalice, but may its light and warmth stay in our hearts till we meet again. Here ends our worship. Let our service begin. <laughs>